So we have a little bit of a unique service this morning, and I'm going to try to explain it on the front end so you're not necessarily caught off guard. Um, but we just came out of a series of very practical takeaways from the book of Proverbs, and we're going into uh, this series on Second Timothy. Um, and I don't know if you've had the opportunity to sit with someone at the end of their life. Um, I've had an opportunity a couple of times, but it's kind of what this book is. And we heard that um, kind of introed last week, but Paul's at the end of his days and he knows that. And instead of throwing in the towel, he's written this book to, to his son in the faith and a lot of practical encouragements. Um, and I'm actually going to read here from another book he wrote to a son in the faith, Titus. Um, but we just want to give you an opportunity this morning to kind of sit in what we unpacked last week as the introduction. So you can kind of view this morning as an extended uh, maybe life group where you talk about the sermon and we're going to have, we just have sound and we're a very big life group today. Um, but we're going to have music throughout and we're going to have um, speaking throughout, encouragements and prompts um, from Pastor Steve. We're going to have opportunities to pray. Um, we're going to have opportunities to um, admonish and encourage one another through song, like I said. Um, so I just want to give you the permission this morning um, to interact with the morning as you need to. Um, we're sitting down on stools, so you can sit down if you want to when we're singing. You're invited to stand if you want to. You're invited to kneel and pray. Um, you're invited to go seek out someone in the room if you need to, to discuss or uh, to make something right. And um, there's just going to be a lot of different things that we're going to encourage you to think about. So it's going to be a little bit of a unique uh, service in that aspect. Um, but I also just wanted to start last week. The final point of Pastor Greg's sermon was we need to be honest about where we are. Um, and he talked about how we shouldn't be shocked that life is hard and that there are difficulties, whether that be personal with sickness and sin and um, things that we can't control, whether that be cultural things that are big and that are um, stressful. Um, the Bible promises there's going to be suffering, there's going to be persecution, there's going to be hardships. Um, and I know oftentimes, for me, I read the stories, especially in the Old Testament, and I kind of separate those people because we know how their situations were resolved. Um, and then we know that Christ came for the disciples. So when they doubted and when they struggled uh, with being faithful and with trusting, it's kind of like, oh yeah, but well, at the end of the day, they chose to believe and Jesus was rose from the dead, and I kind of don't personalize that well. Um, and so I just encourage you this morning that God is the same God now um, in the midst of our culture with whether it be political tension and different beliefs on how our country should be run, whether you should wear a mask, whether you sh don't need to, all the things that we get so caught up in. Um, and I just encourage you this morning to focus your mind and your heart on God um, and on his faithfulness and on his word that remains true. Um, and so I'm going to read this from Titus and it's an encouragement for how they were to live. And obviously it still rings true for us. And I was at a, I helped my brother-in-law at a men's retreat yesterday um, at a different church in the area. And they read this over us and encouraged us like, does this describe your life? Um, and I was very convicted. And so I think it's very appropriate with what we're going to try to do this morning to read this over us and kind of ask you the same question and then ask the spirit to make you aware of areas that you're clinging to yourself or you're clinging to your own ability to figure things out. And then we're going to sing a song uh, that is new, but just that talks about the faithfulness and the stillness of God, that he's the same God now uh, that he was in the Bible. So Titus 3, it says, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient and to be ready for every good work. There's a big one for me, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, to show perfect courtesy toward all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you... 
The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote, to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people, but avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful. He is self-condemned. So I don't know about you, that's uh, heavy to hear. And I think as believers, unfortunately, if we're honest, whether it's what we post on social media, whether it's how we talk about things with our friends, uh, we oftentimes aren't representative of the new believer, the new life that we're called to. So I just encourage you this morning not to be uh, condemned by that or to feel overwhelmed and um, defeated by that, but to be encouraged that Christ is big enough to enable us through his spirit to live differently. And in this moment, we have a cool opportunity to represent him well, not by uh, the way we can wax eloquently about one side or the other on these different issues or the way that we can be just like everyone else when we in, 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 in interact with hardships, but how we remain faithful and trusting of a God who's big enough to overcome whatever it is that the world throws at us. And so this morning, we're going to have an opportunity to sit in that. And we're going to sing a new song that I encourage you to listen to as you begin to ask the Spirit um, to remind you of these truths, that He's good, that He's faithful, that He loves you. And um, like I had to do yesterday where I felt overwhelmed, I could be reminded that Jesus has paid for my selfishness and my pride and my quarreling nature and He's paid for my desire to be right and my desire to win the argument. Um, and I don't have to sit and be that anymore. I can be different because of Christ, and so can you with whatever it is that you're struggling with. Well, as Grayson said earlier, uh, last week we began this series out of Second Timothy that we're calling Unstoppable. The book of Second Timothy was written by Paul, uh, who was in the twilight of his life, who was in prison in Rome awaiting his execution, to Timothy, his son in the faith, who was the overseer of the church of Ephesus. And both of them were dealing with a lot of mess, a lot of mess. And as we began the series last week, Pastor Greg shared with us five concepts, and they're in your notes. So if you want to pull out your, your bulletin and look at the back, they're all there. Um, and these five concepts are sort of woven throughout the book, that are, and they're key to understanding what it means of serving an unstoppable God and how we can live an unstoppable life. And as Grayson said, our, our, our service today is going to be a little unique uh, we're going to spend a little bit more time just thinking about these five concepts that, that were brought up last week. And we're going to do that by providing a lot of time for us to just think and process and pray and worship the Lord. Uh, so there's just going to be a few short devotionals, and then we're going to be quiet. And we're going to let you listen and talk to the Lord, and then we're going to sing and, and worship the Lord together as we think about these things. So I want to encourage you, if you don't have a pen, grab a pen or find somebody down the aisle who has a pen for you, uh, because I want to have you write some things down, some things that you might be thinking about, things that you might need to process um, in order for you to, to really get the most out of this time. And so before we do that, let's just pray together and just ask God to, to be with us as we jump into this. Father, we love you. We're grateful that we are all here together as your family. That we can come and worship you and to hear what you have to say to us through your word. Through you speaking to us and in different ways. And I pray that we will 
be men and women, boys and girls who will, who will listen to you. That we will think seriously about some of these things. And that we will allow you to change our hearts. And we recognize that, that for some, this just hasn't been an easy week. For others, we've been able to rejoice greatly in what you're doing, and that's great. No matter where we are, we know that you are there with us. And so um, use that. to allow us to, to turn our eyes to you, whether it's in rejoicing or whether it's in weeping. Yeah, so God, speak to us and help us to be more like your son as we walk away. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So Grayson already talked about the first concept Know where you are. Um, Second Timothy, Paul knew where he was. He was in prison. He was getting ready to die. He was in that twilight of his life. He was waiting execution. Timothy, on the other hand, he's a young pastor of a church that is in shambles, where there's a lot of, of false teachings going on. A lot of, a little bit of just chaos within the culture. And Timothy is losing his mentor and his friend, his, his father in the faith. And just by recognizing where they were, it was a way of being able to turn to God and allow him to meet them where they are. And so in a few minutes, I'm going to ask you just to think about where you are and be honest with the Lord. To think about what are the things that you're facing? What are your struggles? Are you grieving? Are you disappointed with God? Are you afraid of something? Are you hopeful? Are you thankful? Because it doesn't matter. Wherever you are, God can be there and wants to be there with you in the midst of that. But after that, after we've taken a real honest assessment, an inventory of our life, the next thing that we need to do is determine, or, or to really put in perspective our framework that we should be living by. To put life in the right framework. You know, it's real easy for us to become overwhelmed with our circumstances. Whether we're grieving or disappointed, or whether we're facing some kind of injustice or criticism, whether we're struggling financially or physically or emotionally, inevitably, when our framework for our life focuses on our circumstances, we will respond in ways that are contrary to the Bible. For Paul, life is about Jesus. Life is for Jesus. Life is in Jesus. And at the end of his life, he knows that he will give an account to Jesus. For Paul, Jesus is the beginning, middle, and end of the Christian life. And it should be for us too. And so is that our framework for life? The Bible gives us plenty of truths that we can turn to to help, to help us build the right framework. You know, when you're building a house, you need the right materials. Well, we need to know the materials we need to build the right framework. And here's just a few of them for us. We need to recognize that God knows what's going on. He's in control. We need to remember that God is personally interested in you. That God is good 
all the time. And all the time, God is good in spite of our circumstances. We don't need to fix our eyes on our circumstances, but instead we can really focus on what is coming next, what God has in store for us in the future, because the promises are there. A framework we need to have is that God is for us. Nothing can separate us from God's love. This world is not our home. And that there's an inheritance waiting for us at the end. And those are just some of the things. And so what I want us to do right now is just take a few minutes. And if you can help me here because I'm not clicking properly. But just answer a few questions. And I'm going to give us about four minutes. So you're not going to have tons of time. But not only make an honest assessment of where you are right now. But think about what shapes your perspective of life. Is it your circumstances? Is it your job? Is it your friends? Is it the ministry that you're involved in? Is it your family? Is it the fact that you come here on a Sunday morning and are religious? And then what truths do we need to remember in order to have the right framework? So pull out your pen, pull out your Bible, and just take a few moments moments to jot down. And after a few minutes, Grayson and Jacqueline are going to lead us in another time of worship. So once we've been honest with God about where we are, and once we've recognized what the framework is that we need to build our life around, once we recognize the perspective that we should have on life, the next thing that we need to do is to get our identity right. Lots of things shape the way that we view ourselves. It could be our culture. It could be our successes or our failures. It could be the opinions of others. It could be something that a parent said to you when you were little. Our family often shapes our identity. You know, you've heard it say, you know, in this family, we don't do this, or in this family, we do this. In my family, it's, we don't root for the New York Yankees. We are Detroit Tiger fans. Lots of things shape our identity. And, but when we base our identity on what other people think, or the size of our audience, or the ever-changing standards of culture around us, then the things that we do or the way that we feel about ourselves will change as we become aware that other people are watching us. We'll be influenced based on whether or not we'll receive praise or receive criticism. But Paul knew who he was. Even though he was in chains, Paul called himself an apostle of Christ Jesus. He knew who Timothy was in spite of the difficulty he was having, that Timothy was still his beloved child. And when our identity is firmly rooted in the truth of how God sees us, and when we embrace that identity, then we will learn to live and act according to who we really are and not what other people say. Here are just a few things that that Scripture says about us. That we are a child of God. That we are citizens of heaven. That we are a new creation. Member of Christ's body. We are a servant of God. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We're forgiven. We belong to Jesus. We've been chosen, and we're an ambassador for Christ. And that's just a few, few of the many things that Scripture says about us. But how often are we not living based on these truths? 
What difference would it make in our life if we really understand that we are God's child, no matter what our parents might have thought about us, or no matter what, when we've trusted in Christ, our sins have been forgiven, and we can be free of the guilt of that. How would that affect our life if we really lived within these truths and not the lies that we have come to believe at times? So again, I want to give us a few minutes. Again, pull out your pens and try and answer some of these questions for for yourself. Who or what shapes your identity or has shaped your identity or is currently shaping your identity? What do you believe about yourself? Who does God say you are? And then what lies are you believing that are keeping you from embracing your full identity in Christ? And just think about and pray through and ponder these things. And again, in a few minutes, Grayson and Jacqueline will lead us through another time of worshiping the Lord together. After we've been honest with God about where we are, and we've recognized the framework and the perspective we need to have on life. And after we've gotten our identity right, the next thing we do is that we draw upon the right resources. You know, if I were to take my analogy of we Ruffners, we are Detroit Tiger fans. I don't just say that and let them go out and do whatever they want. I get them, you know, some Tiger gear. You know, they got to get the hat and the shirt and everything else. Take them to games. We haven't just been left to our own devices in our walk with the Lord. We have resources that we can draw upon. As we said here, the book of 2 Timothy was written by Paul as he was imprisoned in Rome awaiting execution. Written to Timothy, his son in the faith, and his protege, who was the head of this church that was struggling. And not only was Timothy receiving this letter knowing that he was about to lose someone who was near and dear to his heart, but he's just wondering, how, is, how am I going to do this when my mentor is going to be gone? And one of the points of this letter is Paul saying to Timothy, don't give up. Be unstoppable. Stay strong. Keep doing what God has called you to do. Certainly by no means will that be easy, emotionally, spiritually, or physically. But throughout the letter of 2 Timothy, Paul reminds Timothy of God's loving favor, of God's compassion, of the Holy Spirit's work in his life. Here's just a few things, just from the first chapter. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power power and love and self-discipline. God has given us his spirit. With the strength God gives you, be ready to suffer for me for the sake of the good news. God gives him strength. And then through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us, carefully guard the precious truth that has been entrusted to you. God gives each of us his strength and his spirit to get through these difficult things in our life. Now this week, a lot of you know just some of the struggles that my family and I have been going through with foster care. And I'm not sure we could have made it really far this week without knowing that we had our brothers and sisters praying for us and giving us encouraging words. So not only has God given us himself and his strength, but he's given us each other. That's why we take 
membership so seriously at this church because we need each other. And he's given us his word that we can turn to at all times for him to speak to us. And he's given us the privilege of being able to go to him in prayer, to approach the throne of grace, to just talk it out with God. We have resources to build upon. But a lot of times we turn to the wrong resources, right? We might turn to our, our Facebook thread, or we might turn to some friends who don't have a whole lot of wisdom in an area, or we might turn to vices, alcohol, or pornography, or something else that makes us feel good about a situation. But it doesn't help us deal with it properly. So let's take a few minutes and think about these things. What resources do you draw upon when you find yourself in difficult circumstances? Do you acknowledge the role of the Holy Spirit in your life? Do you even know how to appeal to the Lord to fill us and empower us? And so while we're thinking about this and writing these things down, what I want to do is not only encourage you to to write things down and to pray about some things, but I also want to invite you to come pray during this time. If God is leading you, just to pray with somebody. Pastor Van and Pastor Will and Galen and myself, we'll make ourselves available just to pray with you. But take some time to really look at what resources you as a believer are turning to. Are they the right ones? All right, so you know, can we take seven minutes, ten minutes to do this together? So after we draw upon the right resources, the next thing we do is we take those resources and we get to work. We need to keep our purpose clear. In the book of Ephesians, Paul says that we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus for good works. He's given us the resources to do good works. And even as we've said before, in Paul writing this letter in prison, awaiting execution, he knew that his purpose was to be a servant of the Lord. There wasn't much he could do from his prison cell. And rather than calling it quits and throwing in the towel, he picked up his pen to teach and encourage Timothy. He reminds Timothy what his purpose is. In 114, it's to guard the good deposit entrusted to him. In 2 2, it's to be a multiplying disciple maker. In 4.2, it's to preach the word in season and out of season. Chapter 4, verse 5, it's to do the work of an evangelist. Similarly, we all have been given a purpose. Most of us are familiar with the concept of the Great Commission, that we are to go and make disciples of all nations. That's an active thing. That is our purpose, to make disciples. As we are going, we are to make disciples. We're familiar with the great commandment to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, our soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself. Here at EBC, we've kind of distilled those two things into one statement. Our purpose is to honor God and to love people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And although that's kind of pithy, it's short and easy to remember, it is so loaded with the purpose that we have as individual followers of Jesus and as a corporate body, as a church, that we are to honor God and love people toward Jesus 
Now, that doesn't say how we're each to do it. We're each gifted with different things. But we each have a purpose. For some of us, it may be singing. For some of us, it may be teaching. For some of us, it may be just encouraging another person with a word here or there. For others, it may be the gift of evangelism. And even if we're not gifted, we're still called to do it and to trust God in the midst of it. But we have a purpose. Our activities should be a platform that help us tell other people about Jesus. Our job, our vocation, should be a platform to help us tell people about Jesus. Our politics, our activism, how we spend our money, where we choose to live, how we use the gifts and talents that God has given us are all intended to be platforms to help us point people toward Jesus. That is our purpose. To spend our life on anything less is to be wasting our time. Now, Certainly there are good ways and bad ways to do it. There are, are beneficial ways and there are ill-advised ways to go about these things. That's why we come together. So in our last little bit of time together, I want us to take just a few minutes to think about this. What kind of things has God gifted you to do? He has made each of you unique. You have something to offer our purpose of pointing people to Jesus. And then how are you using your gifts to build God's kingdom and to share the love of Jesus? Are you doing that? Because that is our purpose. So take a few minutes to think about these things, jot some things down, maybe even ask God to reveal what those things might be. And then in just a few minutes, I'm going to close this with prayer. We'll be dismissed so that we can go out and live according to our purpose.
I'm curious, was this a, an, an, an uncomfortable morning for some of us? I know, I, I'm not one who tends to like to, to think about things too deeply <laughs> at times. I just like to kind of take things in, let it wash over me. But to take the time to really see how this applies and how this fits sometimes takes work. And we, we really wanted to take this morning and use it as an opportunity for us to process what God is going to teach us in the, the weeks and months to come as we dive into 2 Timothy. One thing I would encourage you to do this week is to take that passage out of Ephesians 1 that Jacqueline read and personalize it to yourself. Ephesians 1, 3 through 14 and anywhere in it that you see the words you or us or we, put your name in that. In him, Matt Jobson, you've been redeemed through his blood. In him, Don Dunstan, you have an inheritance. In him, Steve Ruffner, you've been sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. These are true for all of us. Take time this week and go through it and put yourself in it. And then let's go this week and let's live according to the purpose that God has called us to. Pray with me. Father, I pray for each and every single one of us that we will live according to these truths. God, it doesn't matter where we are. You are capable and willing for us to be honest with you of where we are, are right now whether we're walking in joy or whether we are struggling. We know you're okay with that. God, you've given us a new perspective. You've given us a right identity, and you have given us resources to live by. And so, God, with those things, may each and every one of us live according to the purposes that you've called us to. Make us world changers, even if that just means our world that is our next door neighbor. So we love you, we praise you, and we thank you for your word. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. You're dismissed.